We are going to welcome Katrina Lank, John Cariani, and Itai Benson to perform a song for you all. So I hope you enjoy. Hi. Hi. Shalom. Shalom. <laughs> About Petah Tikva, such a city, everybody loves it. Lots of fun, lots of art, lots of culture. That Petah Tikva with a P. Where you are, this is not Petah Tikva. Such a city, nobody knows it. Not a fun, not a art, not a culture. This is Petah Tikva with a B. Like in boring, like in barren, like in bullshit, like in bland. Like in basically bleak and beige and blah, blah, blah. Stick a pin in a map of the desert. Build a road to the middle of the desert. Pour cement on the spot in the desert. That's better think Welcome to nowhere. Behold, where well, there was once only desert, the town of Beta Tikva. Apartments Gaze upon my cafe While you're here, be sure to go back and forth between my cafe and the apartments So much to explore A sand hill of your choosing. Take some bricks that no one's using. Build some buildings, put some Jews in. Then blah blah blah. Beta Here you are in renowned Beta Tikva. Go ahead, look around Beta Tikva. Lucky you, you have found Beta Tikva. Welcome to nowhere. With a B. Welcome to nowhere. Thank you so much. Let's give it another hand. <laughs> that was amazing. So before we jump in, um, for those of uh, for those who, who don't know, uh, please tell us a little bit about the show, the band's visit. Oh, set up the David. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, okay. So the band's visit, which is based on an Israeli film from about ten years ago of the same name, uh, is the story of an Egyptian. A uh, police orchestra that comes to Israel to give a concert, but due to uh, miscommunication at the bus station, instead of going to the city of Petah Tikva that they're supposed to go to, they end up in a tiny uh, village in the middle of nowhere uh, with a similar name, and there's no more transportation for the rest of the night, so they're stranded there, and they get taken in by the locals, and the story is just about what happens over the course of that one night. Great. Uh, <laughs> so it started as a film. Um, what made you guys want to adapt this into a musical? How, what was that process like? Well, it, it was presented to us by our producer, Orrin Wolf, who had the kind of daunting and maybe insane idea that the movie could become a musical. Um, and it took a while to sort of see that. And then it just, for me at least, it clicked, oh, this could really be interesting. And uh, then we were off to the races, slowly. <laughs> like Orin, Orin, Orin was saying it. Is this on? Yeah. yeah. Orin was saying, Orin Wolf, who, again, our lead producer, had had this idea and went around to a lot of people saying, I want to make this into a musical. And people kept saying, oh, I don't see it. I don't see it. I don't see it. And usually if three people tell you you're drunk, you should lie down. But he didn't, he didn't <laughs> do that. And he kept, and, he went, and, and so he eventually found writers who, who, uh, who saw it, who could see it, and had, a, had an idea for it. And it, it's just, it's sort of proof that a lot of things 
might not immediately seem like a good idea, but it's about exe- it's about what you see in it, and it is about execution. You know, any any ideas? Not workable? killing someone. Yeah. Type of execution. <laughs> yeah. But doing well, just something. the execution of <laughs> the execution of an idea. I just thought that was it. I mean, I came in relatively late, so I, I'm speaking about what what transpired before. But from the outside, it appears. Uh, this is the composer, David Yazbek. I'm the composer. This is the, this is the writer, <laughs> Itamar Moses. And, I'm and the this director. is the director, right. David Cromer. Right. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, so that, I just wanted to make that point that it, was, it seemed like it did not immediately adapt itself to a musical, and these guys managed to find a really beautiful way to adapt it into a musical. So, you know. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that vision. So when you were, did you feel like you had to stay true to the film when you were writing the, the book and the music? Um, oh, I mean, yes and no. So, sometimes when something's being adapted um, from source material, if it's source material that everybody knows, some sort of like beloved, hugely famous movie, then there's like fan service you have to do. We didn't have to worry about it in that sense because the movie was sort of a art house cult niche hit, except in Israel where it's like one of the biggest hits of all time. But, <laughs> but everywhere else, it's sort of like, oh yeah, I heard about that movie. That was... Yeah. Um, so we didn't have to stay true to it in that sense. It was just because we loved the spirit of the movie and um, the tone it created and the characters and the story. So, so we, we, we did want to stay true to it um, in, you know, there are, things you have, there are cons- the things you have to sort of take into account when you move from film to stage. You rely more on dialogue than on images, stuff like that. But we, we always wanted to, we didn't want to do one, one of those adaptations where it was like, well, why did you even use that source material, you know, it's sort of not, um, we, we wanted to see if we could like, you know, take the sort of flickering candle flame of this delicate um, story and like transfer it to this other medium without it, without it going out. So yeah, we, we, we wanted to, but sort of in a very non-cynical way, we felt bound to the source material. And I was always happy to, I was always happy to reference the film. I never ran from it. Like, well, we've got to do something different in the film. I never, ever felt that. I wanted to, it was a, it was a fantastic, it was a very rich vein to draw from. I would love to um, speak with the cast and see, had any of you seen the film prior to, yeah? Did you look to it? I mean, I'm, I can imagine that you would want to create your own interpretation of the characters. So what's that balance and how do you kind of approach that? I'll go. Uh, so, what's what's lovely for me is my parents are actually Israeli, so I was familiar with the film. As Ithamal said, it's it's very popular in Israel, um, and my character specifically was actually more developed in this. I play Sami, who has an affair with Katrina's character uh, Dina, um, and that was fleshed out more. So that was exciting to be able to do something with a character that wasn't fleshed out, but uh, to answer your question, I mean, yes, the, the, the film was really helpful to watch and to take from, as Cromer suggested. So. Yeah, great. Um, David, a question for you. Did you, when you were writing the music, I mean, how do you figure out what songs you wanna write, where they're going to go? You know, you're, you obviously are working with, with Itamar here, but like, what, what's that process like and how do you, I mean, I watched the film. I'm like, where's the music? You know, how do you, what, what's your process for figuring it out? Well, it's, a, I, it's different for every show. This was my, this was my fourth show that actually got completed. Um, with this one, uh, there, was a, there was a full script that Itamar had adapted from the movie um, that, and I had only written one song. This is when we did our first reading. Um, after that script was done, uh, songs suggested themselves from the story in the script, some of the lines in the script. Edomar and I did a lot of talking about what should be uh, sung and not sung. And, you know, a year later, changed 50% of that. You know, <laughs> like, that doesn't work, this does work, let's do this instead. Um, you were you were reaching to grab the mic from me. Yeah, but it's, 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 it's it just seems like some much more hostile gesture than I meant. It's just because there's like <laughs> there's a microphone scarcity. Um, uh, uh, yeah, no, the, the a verb that we use a lot, <laughs> a verb that we use a lot uh, to describe that process is cannibalize. Like you have create the book writer creates script material and then you want the <laughs> it to suggest songs in such a way that the composer can cannibalize 
dialogue or monologues or just story moments. So sometimes I will say, oh, that scene could become a song. Yeah. Or that section can become a song. And other times I'll say, you know, if there's nothing to cannibalize, but there's an idea for a song, a lot of the time I'll say to, I said to Itamar, could you write me something to cannibalize? Like literally a monologue or a, you know, little scene or something like that. Or we just have, you know, long conversations with, which were probably very frustrating for, for him, where I would just be, yeah, but what, but why should they, why would you want, why, and then maybe one sentence. My phone would just be on speaker and I'd be like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, he'd be frying an egg. And, and one sentence would come out and I'd be like, oh, I, I see now. You know. it's, it's interesting, actually, because a lot of times um, in, in and I've worked in a couple of musicals also, um, this movie and the script for the movie is very spare and a lot is, un there's the very little, I think my first, my first draft of the adaptation was literally, I want to say 23 or 24 pages long. Like if you actually put all the dialogue in the film in order, uh -huh. there's not much of it. Um, and so what that means, one thing that means is that a lot of things are left unsaid, which is great, but it doesn't give a lot for the composer to springboard off of. So often, so in another, in another kind of a script, there might already be a very explicit monologue where the character talks about exactly what they're feeling and the composer turns that into a song. In Band's Visit, in my, in my first draft, those speeches weren't there because that's not how these people talk and not the sort of the tone of this piece. And, and that was great for me as a songwriter because um, the songs in this show, a lot of them are they don't feel like they're assignments uh, imposed by a script, you know. They're, they come out of character and they come from a very deep place because of that. So I, I'm able to sort of, we, we'll talk about, you know, what, what is this character like? What is he thinking? The movie gives us, gives us hints. And uh, I can actually write from the heart in a much deeper way than I've been able to in other shows. So I, I enjoyed the process, of, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, the music is really beautiful, and there is, um, there are sort of obviously Arabic undertones, Israeli, Egyptian undertones. Um, had you had experiences with Arabic music before? Yeah, I have. There's a story that now, now that we're in, you know, publicity mode for the show, yeah. I've, I've told a lot, <laughs> but I like telling it. I, I, my tastes in music are very eclectic and always have been. And my father is Lebanese. Uh, Lebanese American, first generation, and uh, but never, you know, we had Kiss Me Kate and the Music Man, you know, the, yeah. the, our, our album collection was that and classical stuff, basically. Um, but he took me to Lebanon to visit his father when I was about seven. We were in the taxi from the airport. The taxi driver had uh, music on, the radio, and I, I have a sense memory of it, that the windows were open, it was hot, air blasting in, and uh, there was this music on the radio. And I asked my father to ask the cab driver in Arabic what, what was playing. It turns out it was Um Kultum, who, uh, who was mentioned in a, a song, <laughs> sort of a central, who was the, the, the Frank Sinatra of, of she, was, she was more popular than Sinatra at the time, Middle Eastern singer. Um, and the, the way the orchestra sounded, and this weird, I didn't know it at the time, but these weird, microtones and the, the way she was singing and it all was very, uh, made a big impression on me. So since then, I've been open to it. I've been open to a lot of different kinds of music, pretty much everything except Peking opera, let's say, you know, like, <laughs> you know, there's always something that you, you just can't get, you know, but, but it, you it, should challenge yourself and make that your next well, I did. I went, <laughs> project. I was trying to write a Bruce Lee musical a few years ago, um, but no, I'm, I really was. Um, but um, everyone was like, "Is that a bit?" No, it's not. This it? isn't a bit. Um, but but anyway, so so you know, I was open to it. And then I were, in the '80s, there was kind of this world music, uh, this flourishing of world music. Uh, you know that I guess the record companies thought there's a dollar to be made here, and a lot of that came from Northern Africa and Middle East. And I sort of dove back into it. There's your answer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, I would love to hear from the cast. So uh, obviously there's a very diverse cast on stage with us. Um, and we, I will, you know, kind of ask you some questions about representation because I think that's a, a really um, important thing that the show is, is bringing to Broadway. Um, how did you all prepare for your roles? 
and prepare to sort of, I mean, you're obviously speaking in accents, uh, many of you that are not your own. Um, you know, you're working with a coach. Did, what was the research process like? And then, you know, how did you sort of get into those, into those roles? Everyone's answer is very different. <laughs> yeah. Um, so like Jonathan, my family is also Israeli. And so I grew up speaking Hebrew at home. And I also grew up speaking a little Arabic because my family's Iraqi Israeli. So um, firstly, when I found out about this, I was so excited because I had never even auditioned for an Israeli musical, you know. Um, so I prepared a song in Hebrew, which I was so excited to do um, for my audition. And um, specifically with my character, I like very, I'm not this girl, but I like very much know who this girl in Israel is. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I feel like I've been doing the research for this girl pretty much my whole life, I guess. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, I kind of just like tapped into my parents' accents, to be honest, and uh, my cousin's accents. And uh, that's how I prepared for the audition. Yeah. I could just toss in that the show is interesting in that it, in that it, like in the film, the Israelis tend to speak Hebrew, the, the, the Egyptians speak Arabic, and then they all communicate with each other, sort of struggling in English, which is not anyone's first language. So it's all sort of strangled English. You had pointed out at one point, you realized at one point during tech, I speak no English in the show. I speak right. entirely Hebrew. Which I didn't, actually, I didn't realize oh, wow. until Bill pointed it out to me. And I was like, oh, all of my lines are in Hebrew. That's crazy. <laughs> but it's, it's very cool that I didn't even realize that, actually. George, you are a violinist, and you play, and you play classical Arabic music. Yeah. Tell me about that. I mean, um, well, I, I, I grew up... Uh, playing with my family. We're all musicians in my family. And I'm Lebanese like Yazbek and yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and we all played Arabic music together growing up and it was we played for weddings and parties and family events and I had two old, I have two older brothers who also play and we were kind of like a little traveling band. And so when I saw about this mu and now I'm an actor in, in the city when I saw about this musical about an Arabic band like my head exploded. I was like what the hell did they're gonna do about an Arabic band. That thing's gonna close in a day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> prove me wrong. Uh, so I was like, I gotta get in that. And then just being part of this this group where uh, a lot of people get to a lot of people play, and we get to play music together, and it comes out of this man's mind. And to make to sidetrack, because I don't know what the hell I'm saying about myself anymore. I'll talk about Yazbek. Um, <laughs> what's song. yeah? I think so. <laughs> what's what's wonderful about Yazbek? And his music, as now I'm thinking about it, I think he really approaches his com his composition like an actor. He's not just trying. For this show, it's not like, oh, did you listen to Arabic music and then write an Arabic song? It's like he didn't just try to write Arabic music, klezmer music. Like these are all like parts of his eclectic taste and his history and the rich experiences that make him a very unique uh, and diverse individual. And through that, I think he just tried to like become these characters and what are they gonna say? And then. That's and then how are they going to talk? And then what's their circumstances? And that's layered into, like Arabic music coming out or Arabic instrumentation coming out or klezmer type stuff or certain instrumentation for a certain songs. So that's, um, he's a wonderful guy, and uh, I, I respect no one on the stage as much. No. <laughs> you guys, um, but it's it's but it's very true. Like he didn't because people are like, oh, did it? Is the score Arabic? I'm like, the score is not Arabic, but it's. It's Yazbek and the Arabic that he knows and the, the music that he's opened himself up to translated through him. And that's what makes it a really awesome musical and not just like trying to copy an Um Kulthum concert and putting it on stage. And then we're like, oh, what's the show about? Well, we just put some Um Kulthum songs. And he's like, that's not interesting. It's interesting because it's this man's score. And that's why it's authentic. Right. One of the things the show, one of the themes the show deals with is how people can relate through music and how like you can, if you're stuck for something to talk about, music might be a good conversation or listening to music or talking about things. And there's the, the, sh the, the film touches on this and then uh, Edmar and Yesbeck really expanded on this that in the show, uh, they play old American pop songs. They sing, uh, they sing Gershwin. They sing, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the people are listening to, there's a klezmer music. There's, so it's, it's, wor it's music that, People have that everyone has heard. Does that, mean, does that mean I'm not explaining that well? But but that 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 there's a there's influences from all kinds of music because this is a generation of people who have managed to hear little bits and pieces of music from all over the world. So it's it's about a lot of things. What are the other songs we're going to be performing tonight uh, today? Um, Uncle Tum. And what's the other one? And oh, and ask me. Okay, okay. Yeah. 
Um, I wanted to know for segue purposes. <laughs> <laughs> Smooth segues. Um, and here's one right now. Uh, <laughs> Katrina. <That's nice>. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we talk a lot about uh, Um Kultum. Katrina, did you know about, um, about Um Kultum? And did you, was that part of your research process? Uh, I had not heard of Um Kultum before. Okay. And of course, one must know. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I... You know, thank God for the internet. There's a lot of stuff you can find. Uh, did you there's use, a lot of things you, you don't want to find. But I used Did you use Google? Google. What search engine did you use? Yeah. So I have Google to thank for my knowledge of Um Kultum. Uh, <laughs> David, can you give her another $20? Uh, oh, hey, I think you guys should make me give me $20. Um, Sergey can give her $20. Uh, but she... Uh, and. What am I saying? So, yes, there's recordings uh, available in, on the internet, but also um, I've learned things from George Aboud, who, like, like he said, is really familiar with Arabic music and helped me kind of understand what I was hearing because it's such a different way of expressing musicality than what we do in our Western, and even in classical music, our, what we consider classical music. So um, that was really a fascinating thing to learn, and I'm still learning about all of the differences of uh, Um Kultum's music. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you're actually, I mean, in your last show in Decent, which was on Broadway recently, Yay. yes, uh, and you were incredible. Yeah. Um, you were playing violin. It was a viola. A viola, I'm sorry. Um, so, you're, so I'm sure that could, that would kind of help you as you're I mean, preparing for this role. And you guys actually did a song recently together for Artists for Peace. Yes. Where, yes. For world, world Peace, yes. And you, um, you played and you sang beautifully. Thank you. And how did that come about? Well, George. Well, it, well it, Sharon. Well. Sharon, well. 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 <laughs> no. Sharon, talk about the wonderful. Okay. So I, I, I love this charity called Artists for World Peace. Um, they're wonderful. And I've been producing a Broadway charity event for them every year. And this was our seventh year. And um, last year was our first time we had some performers from Broadway shows sing in other languages. And I was like, oh, this is so great because it's world peace. So this year I asked a lot of people from the band's visit to perform. And George and Katrina said they wanted to sing something together in Arabic. And I said, that would be wonderful. That would be perfect. So they did. Yeah, so <laughs> we kind of joined forces on this and really wanted to I, and I and I listen to lots and lots of Arabic music. That's kind of all I listen to in jazz. But um, I was listening. I heard this song where it's just oud, which is the predecessor of the guitar. It's the, like the lute-like instrument. And it was just uh, the composer playing the oud and this. And he was teaching the singer the song, so they were kind of just like noodling through it. And I thought that was like a lovely little back and forth. So I thought this would be a good one to teach. Katrina, and that we learned we learned it together because I didn't know the song. You'll either. be doing yourself a favor to go on YouTube and look up uh, Katrina Link and Georgia Abood and Wahab W H A B, and you'll get that link. And it's I've watched it now eight or ten times. It's so gorgeous. It really is. And it has nothing. You know, I didn't write the song. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like it's like yeah, this it's this combination. This I called it a talent avalanche. It's just you could watch it a million times. Now they're going to pass you $20. I would like that $20. <laughs> <laughs> um, Katrina actually has a beautiful song in the show um, about Um Kultum, and we are going to hear it now, uh, in a minute. Right. And, well, I was just going to say that yeah. it, 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 at, a, at sort of the center point of the show, um, uh, the, one of the, uh, the Egyptian band leader character and Katrina's character, who is an Israeli cafe owner, are having kind of an awkward conversation and trying to find their way to conversation. And like in many conversations in the show, they're able to find their way to it by, he accidentally mentions that he plays classical Arab music. And she says, oh, like Um Kaltum? And he says, oh, yeah. And she goes, oh, I love that. And he says, no, you, you, come on, you don't, you don't. He says, you're being polite, don't, you don't. And she, it actually accessed something in her life that she cared about very, very deeply and hadn't probably talked about in a while, hadn't had anyone to talk about it with in a while. And then this, this I think this very beautiful song comes out of it. Great. That's, what, that's what the context. So please give it up for Katrina Link hey. singing hey. Um Kultum and Omar Sharif. Came floating on the jet. 
jasmine wind from the west from the south honey in my ears spice in my mouth dark and thrilling strange and sweet cleopatra and their handsome thief and they And they floated in on a jasmine wind Um Kultum and Omar Sharif Friday evening Omar Sharif In black and white and blurry through tears My mother and I would sit there That was beautiful. And that is one of my favorite songs in the show. And before we were talking a little bit, uh, I learned that it was actually cut. It was cut in an earlier iteration. Tell me about that. It was, <laughs> I don't know what the fuck we were thinking. <laughs> um, I, I, you know what? You have a better memory than me. And, and you'll be funnier. <laughs> um, I begged him not to cut it. <laughs> no, uh, you know, musicals are very difficult, and, it's, and one of the reasons they're difficult is that with a play, if I'm writing a play, I can have five friends who are like good actors come over to my apartment and read it cold on my couch and basically have an understanding of what I've got. In a musical, you can't do that, you, because to see how all of the different pieces of machinery work together, you need a week for everybody to learn the music, and you kind of probably want them on their feet a little bit. to get. And so to get the flow of the whole thing, you need you know tens of thousands of dollars in a week of rehearsal. Um, all of which is to say, when you're developing a musical, it'll be six months between opportunities to do that. There's even union rules about how often you're allowed to do that. So you're sort of around the table, kind of hearing it. And, so, and in that context, you can be like, well, I don't know, are we bored here? Like, let's move on. Or, or actually, we don't want a song from her, we want a song from him about what he's feeling. And, and um, in a way, there, there's a, a, a maybe apocryphal story about, maybe it's Stanislavski or something, or some Russian director who was, like, was asked, like, how long do you want to rehearse this show? And he said, two years. And they said, you can't have two years. And he said, then two weeks. <laughs> the, the, point, the point being, you don't want the, it's possible to have enough time to sort of mess something up. So, and that's so. What, that's what happened. Let me just say yeah. one quick thing, which is that, you know, and this is like, this would be a part of the talk 
that Google might pay me like $25,000 to give the same cr like crowd about collaboration at Google. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is just a suggestion, and my fee is a little higher than that. But um, you can, there's, you know, we, we have collaborated, first Itamar and I, then the three of us, then all of us have collaborated beautifully and very closely. Um, you want to listen to the other people, but there's a, there are times, I'm not blaming what I'm about to say on either of these guys, but there are times when, because when, this happened a long time ago in the process, when we had a different person uh, involved. Um, and uh, you can over, be over collaborative. You can say, oh yeah, okay, we can cut that song. Sort of to prove that you have it in you to cut a song, to cut a beautiful, you know, your baby. Because that's what it's all about. Like, don't, you know, you have to be willing to sacrifice your babies. Okay, let's cut it. Then, <laughs> then David Cromer comes onto the project and he's like, what, what is that song? <laughs> you know, like, what, why isn't it in the show? Why did you cut it? You idiots! You know? and, and it's sort of like, yeah, you're right. We are idiots. It's a beautiful song. She sings it beautifully. So that's a little lesson in collaboration. <laughs> and the specific facts of it are, it was thought for a while that at that point in the show, we should hear from Tufik, the character Tufik in the scene. And then it was realized that we would hear from her. And it was a... Sometimes something like that's a coin flip, and it, we, we, we placed ourselves in the path of a, of a fortuitous accident. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in a way, a more practical and compact answer to the question is that Katrina's character, Dina, sings four or five times over the course of the yeah. show, and Tufik sings almost never. So we were sort of thinking, surely we need to hear more from him um, and not over and over again from her, and it turns out that's wrong. <laughs> you, want, you do want to hear her sing again and yeah. again, and, yeah, and, and that, it, surely, that surely is the sound of the rule book, that, yeah, yeah. That, that to do a show like this, you have to be ripping up constantly, constantly, constantly. And you, and when, if you're working at Google, if you're coding or... Uh, <laughs> I, I, I have $25,000 coming here. <laughs> um, I would love to hear from the cast. So this show before it hit Broadway was um, at the Atlantic. And uh, many of you were actually involved with that Atlantic iteration, right? Um, I mean, so and and who was not involved? Who was who was not involved? Okay, cool. Right, Itai and Adam. Um, so I would love to hear from you guys. Um, just please introduce yourself. The the role that you're playing. Um, you know what's it, what's it like interpreting a role off Broadway and then taking it onto a bigger stage? Um, how are you sort of? Be, are you becoming more aware of your movements? Um, how you know you're playing to a bigger audience? Obviously, what's what's that like for you? Um, my name's Rachel Prather, and I play Julia. Uh, as an actor, that's a dream situation, especially in the time frame that we were given, uh, because we got to do this show in a very intimate setting off-Broadway, 200 Seat Theater. And a pretty long rehearsal process with um, table work and putting it on our feet, and then we took a break for like nine months. And then we found out we were going to Broadway, and so you have all of that time for um, your characters to just sink in and do more research on your own. And um, I, I loved having two different iterations of the show and being part of both of them. It was really special. I'm John, and I play Itzik. And when I found out we were going to Broadway, I said, oh, great, my Hebrew will be good and my accent won't be terrible. <laughs> because when we were downtown, my accent wasn't very good. So it was very <laughs> exciting to get to revisit it. But it was great because we had Itai and Sharon and Jonathan uh, to help us. Um, and it was also fun to just do it in a big space uh, because the Atlantic was really small. And I remember David came up to me one day and he said, see, now you can lean back on the couch because we're in a big space. <laughs> so that was really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> well, is it hard to sing in, in an accent? Like, is that, is that challenging for you guys? You should talk about that. I, yeah, I should talk. <laughs> I, I, uh, it is, it is um, challenging. I think the most challenging part about it, though, is that we learned through the process that some things could not be understood if I was singing it in the accent that I was speaking it in. So like we were literally negotiating each and every vowel and consonant. So like this r is a r and this one is r and this one we're tapping and 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 um so so that is I think like not even we're not talking about uh, singing in an accent. That's a whole other thing. But but it's a really interesting negotiation to sort of speak in a dialect and then figure out how in, in song you can, you can be understood and still give sort of the flair and essence of, 
of the dialect. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of work. It took a lot of work. Yeah, and Andrew, um, I learned that your wife is actually involved with the production as a dialect coach and I think you said a, a dramaturg. Right. Tell, yeah, what's, that, what's it like working with your wife? I, <laughs> I live with the dialect coach. <laughs> um, so I got a lot of notes. <laughs> and uh, she's Israeli, I'm not. And so it was also helpful in terms of the, you know, the context of the play. To, I learned a lot from her. Yes, obviously, we all did, uh, the Israelis, from, uh, with our accents. But also, I have been immersed in Israeli culture um, by uh, the marriage choice I made. <laughs> and, uh, the best was the way she gave him dialect notes and the way she gave the rest of us dialect notes. She was so kind and polite and cheerful with us, and she was kind of hard on him. <laughs> yeah, she was. She was, like, she was, and she'd come to me and say, Beseda, Beseda. No, Beseda, no, Beseda, Beseda. All right. <laughs> Better go home. So that's what happened. Yeah, um, we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. So please um, line up at the mics on either side. And uh, we have a question over here. First of all, thank you so much for coming. And very impressive. If you didn't grow up saying ha to be able to do it, I'll give you a lot of credit. Um, you know, I, you guys all collaborate beautifully. Um, but obviously, there's a lot of underlying political tones about the, about the story and the message. And I'm wondering what it meant to some of you to be part of it, especially if you're, uh, you know, grew up Israeli or Lebanese, and um, what it meant to like bring together on stage, if it was difficult, if you were, like how your families felt about it. So just curious to hear about that. I have a lot of opinions about that. Uh, it's, 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 it's really, really, really complicated. I mean, first hand, I didn't, you asked about representation. I mean, on the, on the first level, like those of us in the cast who come from Middle Eastern backgrounds, there was so much sort of self-inflicted pressure to get this job because this felt like our ticket to like have a thing. So that there's that. But um, the other thing, how many times did you uh, did you audition? Seven. <laughs> uh, the last three were just the last three were just a, we, yeah we were just kidding. Seven auditions really good. No, and I think like like uh, but but it's it's also really interesting to sort of uh, I think understand ourselves in that in this identity because I, for example, am the son of a Yemenite Israeli father. So I'm Jewish and Israeli, but also my, my family practices a lot of Arab traditions. Uh, and I've always felt like, at least as I've entered the business in New York, like I have this birthright to play um, Middle Eastern characters. But, but I think as we play this, I'm starting to realize all of the nuance that's needed. And, and, and um, I don't really know what I'm saying anymore other than the fact that it's lovely to take on this other culture. And I'm learning a lot. And there's this beautiful drummer in the cast named... Osama Farouk has been extremely helpful, who's um, Alexandrian. Um, but I think it means a lot to many of us personally. It means a huge amount to me to be able to play this role and it not really being political at all. It, it allows me to understand myself as a Yemeni, Israeli, Middle Eastern American man differently and more confidently. Yeah, yeah the, I mean, just... Uh, um, yeah, and I definitely want to hear more from you guys because we, uh, I, I don't know, it's, it's, I'm curious how, actually, how it feels for you guys after running it for so long because we had one answer to this question when we were rehearsing it, but now it's been theirs. It's been entirely in their hands dealing with, you know, meeting people at the stage door and how people are reacting. So I'm, but I, I know that us going into it, and it's one of the reasons I think the movie is so successful is that it's not that it's, um, it's not that it's, apolitical or that it avoids politics. It makes this enormously political statement by demonstrating that uh, when you strip away, uh, you know, the, uh, the things that we normally see in headlines about the region, rhetoric from leaders, you know, uh, disputes over borders, this is one group of people that needs food and a, pl and a roof and another group of people that has those things. And when everything else is stripped away, uh, it's about, you know, uh, uh, those basic human needs and things over which you can connect. So there's something, there's something, uh, it's not that it's not making a political statement, it's that the political statement it's making is that there are elemental human things beyond politics. And I think that's why, um, is, you know, it's such a, it, it was such a hit as a film when it was released in Israel, and I think it's, it's kind of how it's operating here. But I want to hear more from you guys. Um, I, I, I've heard from so many people, my family's also Israeli, and a lot of uh, Israeli and Middle Eastern people at the stage show will say that they're so refreshed that it wasn't, you know, uh, 
no politics were sledgehammered down the throats of the audience. Um, uh, it's just, it's a very human story that could honestly take place anywhere. Um, it just, we happen to look at it through the lens of the Middle East. There's a moment in the film, Itamal, you've talked about this yeah. a lot, that um, when the Egyptian band arrives and they sit at the cafe to eat, there's a, a photograph on the wall of a, a tank and possibly from the Yom Kippur War, I'm not, I'm not really sure. You just kind of get a quick glimpse of it, and one of the band members takes his hat off and just hangs it right over the photo, and the photo's covered. And that kind of just sets the tone for the film, and, and that's the tone of our show, too, is that it's all underneath. All the political tensions that we all know about are there, but, but we're, choosing, we're choosing in our, in our show to, to sort of, like, let's set those aside for now. And I think that sentiment is... Uh, it transfers beautifully to the, the play from the film. And just also from the actor's perspective, being a Middle Eastern actor in the city, uh, auditioning for other shows and TV shows and whatnot up until this point, it gets really exhausting to play um, kind of the same thing over and over. It's just this very stereotypical idea of what the region is, and it's always about politics and war and terrorism. And, and it's like uh, this show is about... People. It's just about people who happen to live in the Middle East, and these people are not defined by the politics of their government. Um, they have their own ideas, their own, you know, stories. So, um, you know, the fact that it's a Middle Eastern musical and I wasn't auditioning for Terrorist Wife Number Three <laughs> was really, really refreshing and wonderful. So I feel very grateful to be a part of this story. Thank you so and much. I Your answers are beautiful. Oh, please. I was just saying, what moves me as an American—I'm not Israeli. My family's not Israeli. But what, what moves me as an American doing this piece? In an American, in, in, in America, in an American theater with Americans, is telling a story about two groups of people from very different backgrounds with very different ideologies coming together and just being together for a night. I was excited to hear that a lot of you actually took a trip together to Israel. To, what was that like? I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I'd, I'd been there, um, cause I have family there also, but I, and I'd been there before, but, but yes, between the off-Broadway and the Broadway productions, Yazbek and Cromer and Katrina and Ariel was there and George was there. Um, we went to, uh, for a few days to Israel and specifically we went to Yerucham, which is the town in the desert where he, where Aaron Kohler and the filmmaker made the film, the movie. So Beit HaTikva is, is fictional, but it's based on this, this little village in the middle of nowhere. Um, and uh, it was sort of profound to, 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 to go there, not just to see the locations from the movie that we knew, but like to feel the isolation and, and kind of the vastness of the desert around you um, was really something, yeah. Yeah, we stood outside in the desert for what felt like hours just listening to the wind. And I'd be like, you guys, can we go on the bus? It's hot. <laughs> but the, that, that sound of just wind coming from someplace you can't explain because there's nothing for it to bounce off. Like, where is it coming from? But it's like, in your ears and the sun and the sky. Like, just uh, getting to experience that was really extraordinary. Oh, wow. Okay, we're going to close out with a song. But before we do, I want to play a quick game. Um, so this is a parlor game. It was um, popularized by Marcel Proust in the 1880s. And the whole point of it is to get to know the answerers um, on a deeper level. So you guys down for a game? Yeah. Great. Um, and we'll just popcorn and uh, feel free to jump in when you want. Um, okay, favorite Middle Eastern dish? Jachnun. <laughs> Jachnun, you guys know what Jachnun is? It's like this, it's a breakfast food. It's basically like layers of dough and butter rolled, baked in the oven overnight for like 12 hours. Oh and you eat God. it with crushed tomatoes and a hard-boiled egg. 12 Chairs in the West Village has incredible jachnun on the weekends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll say grape leaves, which are big in Lebanese culture. Oh, God. <laughs> Hummus? <laughs> <laughs> My aunt's jachnun. <laughs> Tabbouleh. Oh, you took mine. Oh, I like Tabbouleh, too. <laughs> Shawarma. Yes. We don't have to go all the way around. Yeah, we can, we can jump. Um, I have my dinner menu for tonight. Thank you. Um, go to audition song. <laughs> I love singing that. 
I have confidence from the sound of music. <laughs> These are all lies. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's real. <laughs> a word or phrase you overuse. I have a five, but a girl, I call all, all my friends girl. <laughs> it's not gender specific. Okay, in, girl. In Hebrew, I say charabaleben a lot, which is like, uh, it's a curse word probably from the 60s because that's what my dad says. And it means literally shit in yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you call me? Okay, yeah. Him, no. <laughs> oh, oh, I call him. His name is John Cariani, so I call him John Chariani, which means <laughs> shitty Ani. <laughs> <laughs> Cast album you play in the shower or you listen to in the shower? My Fair Lady. Dear Evan Hansen. <laughs> in the shower, you guys? Really? Is that what he said? In the bath. In the theoretical shower. In the theoretical oh, shower. Oh, like... <laughs> my three-year-old three sings the band's visit every day, the whole album. Oh. Not in the shower. Which is now available on Spotify. <laughs> and... I, I, I avoided listening to Hamilton for like a year after, it, just because out of envy, just sheer envy of how successful it was. And then once I listened to it, I couldn't stop. And I listened to it like the entire album, like on the elliptical every single time for like another year. And then I, and then I had to stop. <laughs> you ride the elliptical? <laughs> Yeah, can't, you can't tell? The, no, I just, uh -uh. I just thought you'd be more of a treadmill kind of guy. I would, but then I'm old now, and now it hurts my feet. My feet hurt if I use the treadmill after. Yeah, <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> um, album you know all the lyrics to? Into the Woods. Into the Woods. You know they're making a musical of that. <laughs> Diablo Cody's doing both. <laughs> um, if you weren't an actor or a writer or director, what would you be? Teacher. Google. <laughs> <laughs> I'd probably be a, like on like in a D League basketball team in Israel. Oh yeah, I'd be an assistant <laughs> basketball coach. That would be fun. I'd, I'd probably just take care of horses somewhere. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Ski bum. That's a drink. What do you say? Ski bum. Is that a job? Falconer. <laughs> <laughs> One clap. <laughs> okay, and your moment of perfect happiness. When are you happiest? When I'm with my daughter. At my camp in Maine. At my camp in Maine. The first good preview. <laughs> <laughs> Six weeks yeah. Hiking with my husband. Do you, have, do you have a moment of peace? What's that? No peace for you? <laughs> Are you ever happy? <laughs> no. He's never happy. Okay. In the Google cafeteria. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty awesome. <laughs> All right. Um, we are going to close out with a song. So please give it up for the cast, uh, for Adam Cantor and the cast as they sing Answer Me.
masquerades as moon If I try I might take off like a sparrow And I'll travel along a guiding going for the cast of the band's visit. Thank you all. And go see the band's visit. It's at the Ethel Barrymore Theater on Broadway. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you guys.